Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Um, you know, in the last four years or so, the Mediterranean Sea has become a hub for human smuggling. People fleeing poverty and war aboard rafts headed for Greece, Italy, and Spain. Many die of drowning. Some end up washing up on the shores. Others are rescued, uh, some by a German nonprofit that risks the Mediterranean waters to pluck refugees from sinking rafts. The new Academy Award-nominated short documentary, Lifeboat, follows one of the boats connected to that German nonprofit and bears witness to one of the greatest humanitarian crises the world has known. Let's take a look at Lifeboat. We found another rubber boat, zero, one, two degrees. Is there another one, though? Yeah, they look big. People are risking their lives to sail from North Africa to Europe. It sank less than 10 miles off Libya. Libyans were fleeing poverty and war. Three shipwrecks in just three days. Or only a handful survived. Don't jump! Stay on the boat! Stay on the boat! Et quand j'ai su, j'ai dit non, il y a deux casseurs. La vie et la mort. Everybody, please welcome director of the beautiful lifeboat, Sky Fitzgerald. Uh, Sky, thanks so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on, on this project, this incredible film. Uh, I've watched many a news story, read many a news story, and seen some documentaries about uh, the refugee crisis, and particularly in the Mediterranean, and it's rare that a filmmaker at this point, I think, can capture a new story, a different story, and tell it from an angle that it makes still makes it uh, illuminating and as heartbreaking um, as it is, because we grow desensitized to the story over a number of years, and you were able to sort of bring it back to life. Um, you shot this in 2016, right? Yeah, that's right. And how, did, how were you alerted to what was going on, and what made you want to go out there? Yeah, um, so we, um, we're doing a trilogy of films about the global refugee crisis. Um, and so on the tail end of the first one, which was called 50 Feet from Syria, we were on the Syrian-Turkish border uh, working with a doctor. And um, there were many, many medical personnel, doctors and nurses and NGO workers who told us that as soon as that border uh, into Greece were shut down across the Izmith, that um, the refugees from Syria would be forced to um, migrate or move more westward and that the central Mediterranean was likely going to be a really high mortality area. And so they, you know, we heard this over and over again. So we started doing due diligence and started researching it, and we discovered pretty quickly that the mortality rate was already high. And what are we looking at in terms of height and, and oh, numbers? It, it was. I know they're not exact, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I forget exactly what the numbers were at that point in time, but they were definitely in the high thousands, like maybe five thousand a year. Um, and so we also discovered almost simultaneously that. Um, because the EU's response, because, you know, that's the southern border of the EU, was slow um, and they weren't really prepared for that shift in pattern, that, that the mortality rate was high, but there were some civil so so society groups that were intervening um, to sort of save people. I mean, there's no other way to say it. They, um, they purchased vessels, um, all volunteer groups, and just motored down to that area to pull people from the sea. And what was the group that you found that you ended up uh, getting on a boat with? Yeah, we worked with a group called Sea Watch, which is a Berlin-based NGO that is comprised completely of volunteers. And when they saw that this was happening, they decided they wanted to do something about it. So this group of, you know, citizens banded together and said, "What can we do?" And they bought a boat, raised funds, bought a boat, and started helping people. Now, uh, I think it's safe for me to assume you being a documentary filmmaker, already wanting to make something about the refugee crisis, already being 50 feet from Syria, have seen a fair amount of humanitarian crises across the globe in your career? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have, uh, for better or for worse. Um, I, I hope it's for better. Um, you know, I, I think one of my um, abiding principles that I try to use in my work is... is selecting stories that, that pass the so what test, right? Um, I feel like if I'm going to devote my own resources and my own time and my colleagues' time to telling a story, I, I wanna do it around a story that I feel like is important, um, timely, and can, can help in some small way 
build empathy for those less fortunate than ourselves. And so even though this is a difficult story, I felt like it was one that really needed to be told and specifically one that in the, here in the West we don't really f understand fully. Um, and I wanted to bring that to a Western audience. Right. How do you feel like this story is normally told to a Western audience? Um, it's a good question. I think we're, we're more focused here on our own southern border often. Um, but, you know, the, the, the rhetoric of, you know, the last couple of years has really changed, I, I think, our conversation around refugees and immigrants and asylum seekers in general. And I think the fact that this is a global problem um, and we look at it as a global problem is really important for us as Americans to think about. So we have a problem here, yeah. but this is a global issue. I mean, the number of displaced people right now in the world is greater than it's ever been yeah. in, in modern history. The cynical part of me is like, good luck getting Americans to think about a global political problem or the root cause of a global political problem. Having bared witness to so many um, moments that are humanitarian crisis around the world, how did this, and not to compare or contrast, but what was this like? What did it feel like being on this boat and seeing these people, you know, stuck in the middle of the sea? Well, it was heartbreaking in a word. You know, I think any time that you're um, in a triage environment, you know, and the, the stakes are life and death, you can't help but feel as a human being for, for those who are experiencing it most closely. And so we, we experienced, we, we saw and experienced that in a really visceral way immediately. You know, on the, on the second day of our search and rescue mission, you know, Sea Watch came across um, over the course of three days, over 3,000 people floating in the middle of the ocean. And we were the only search and rescue vessel in the area at the time. And it was a 30 meter vessel, right, with 16 crew. So what do you do when you're 16 people on a 30 meter boat, you know, and there's over 3,000 people there? It's true triage, right? And so the suffering is real. Um, how you deal with it is immediate. Um, and amazingly, at the end of our journey, um, all but two of those people survived. And that, to me, that's a testament of, uh, of what civil society can do in these Two situations. people died on the, on the boat? Not on our boat, but of the asylum seekers. Yeah, out of over 3,000. So one, one um, woman died of exposure yeah. before we could reach her. Another gentleman um, was pushed off his boat and couldn't swim. And he drowned before our Zodiac could get to him. Unbelievable. And uh, on your boat, you, you interview a number of people who, uh, who were picked up. And how did you, how many interviews did you conduct? And what was it like talking to these people? It's, I mean, we keep, we'll, we'll keep going back to the word heartbreaking, I think. But, um, you know, what was, what was it like keeping your composure while talking to them and maintaining, maintaining a form of objectivity? Because their stories are just incredibly sad. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I sometimes draw a distinction or delineation between being a journalist and a filmmaker. You know, um, I, I consider myself a filmmaker and, and not a journalist. And so my, my goal and intent uh, with this project was to build empathy um, and to tell the truth of the people that we discovered, right? Not, not to contextualize the entire situation necessarily. So when we, when we, when people were pulled out of the ocean and they were on our ship for varying periods of time, you know, um, the first thing was to build trust, right, is, was to go to them um, to, to assess whether they even had any interest of sharing their story at all. And amazingly, many of them did. And so we heard many and varied stories of what they experienced in Libya before they even took the risk of pushing off from Zabrata, the beach in Libya, where most of these boats leave from. How aware were they of the changing rhetoric, both in Europe and the United States, in regards to to refugees, because I'd imagine in 2015 they may refugees may feel like they're coming into a well a somewhat welcoming uh, situation. Yeah, I think that to me that's one of the great uh, a great sadness that I carry with me uh, out. You know, showing the film nowadays is because that rhetoric has dramatically changed the welcome or the lack of welcome that asylum seekers. Um, are, are receiving. So at that moment in time, there was a general sense of optimism among the asylum seekers that um, Europe, you know, one of the, the most educated areas of the world, would welcome them with open arms and that each discrete asylum seeker case 
would be vetted properly and that they would have a chance to be heard through the, you know, the regimented UNHCR system. Um, that system is currently broken because of the rise of right-wing nationalism in Europe right now. Um, so at that moment in time, each of these search and rescue vessels, you know, they had close contact with what's called MRCC, which is the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Rome, which is an EU entity. And as soon as the rescue was, was undertaken, uh, they would radio to MRCC, and an EU transport vessel would come into the area, and they would offload the asylum seakers, and then they'd be brought to the shores of the southern, of the southern Europe so their cases could be heard. Usually they'd, they'd go to port in Italy or they'd go to port in Greece or Spain, um, and they'd have a proper process to go through. That has changed, um, and it's changed pretty dramatically since then. So, um, you know, Salvini, the, the, um, the deputy prime minister of Italy, has been a driving political force in preventing search and rescue operators from operating at all. He's even exerted political pressure on the countries uh, that provide flags to some of these vessels, like Panama, for example. And he threatened Panama uh, that if they didn't pull the flag from one of these search and rescue operators, then no vessel flying a Panamanian flag would be allowed to dock in any Italian port, which is a huge economic threat, right? So a number of things like that have taken place. And so in, in that dearth of operators now, what's happened is that the EU has simultaneously tried to shut down the search and rescue operators, and they've started to fund the Libyan Coast Guard to do this search and rescue oper operation work. And they are in no way prepared to do this kind of work at all. To I mean, and what people were already trying to escape in Libya and the sort of rampant corruption that happens in Libya. I mean, what happens with the Libyan Coast Guard when they capture these people? I can't imagine it's above board. Now, the Libyan Coast Guard, so, so two weeks after we did um, our mission, Sea Watch went out again, because they usually go on two-week cycles, and um, with, with an almost new crew, just because the, the psychological toll of doing this kind of work. So they went out again, and they, they were undertaking um, a rescue operation. There was a single raft with about 130 people on it, and um, right as they launched their Zodiac to go and uh, intervene and, and save some of the asylum seekers, the Libyan Coast Guard showed up. And two officers from the Libyan Coast Guard boarded this craft with clubs and commenced to walk down the middle of it, clubbing the asylum seekers so they could get to the outboard motor on the back. And um, in, during the course of that, they pointed a 50 caliber machine gun at the Sea Watch crew so they couldn't intervene. So after they got this, you know, outboard mortar worth 5,000 euros, they put it back on their um, vessel and motored away. And during the course of that event, 23 people drowned. And that's the organization that the EU is currently funding to do these operations. So that's the current state of things. Right. How do you solve a humanitarian crisis, make a worse one, it sounds like? That's what's happened, yeah. In the midst of this... Um horror and 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 pain um you have a central character to lifeboat who is a uh was a really beautiful human the captain of the boat who is able to emotionally contextualize what is happening uh or, or place it in context within the rest of the world and even even within history i would say what was it like when you met um captain john John Castle was uh, inspiring to me personally as just a human being. He, I think, he inspired a lot of people during the course of his life. You know, he um, he he was a man who lived by his principles. Um, I think if he believed something, he he lived by that. Um, he was the original captain of Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior, which was an anti-whaling vessel. You know, that went all around the world uh, fighting the whaling companies. Um, and he, for the latter stage of his life, in addition to working with Greenpeace for a long period, he dedicated uh, quite a bit of time to Sea Watch as a volunteer captain because he felt like it was the right thing to do near the end of his life and that um, who, who better to, to give of their skills than, than a captain, right, in this sort of situation. And so you meet him, you get on this boat, you see that he's your captain, and what do you think right away as a filmmaker? Well... You know, he stepped, he stepped onto the boat, and we originally thought we would be, you know, sort of 
marshaling the story around someone else, uh, but then she couldn't go on this particular mission. And so we really didn't know how we were going to tell the story. But when he stepped on the boat and, and spoke for the first time, um, I felt like I was in the presence of a poet. Uh, and, and that really resonated with me. I thought, you know, he not only is this person who just volunteers his great skill set, you know, over and over again, but he's eloquent and he's educated and he can speak really sort of lovingly about the craft of what he does. Did he, uh, I mean, he does it within the film. I imagine he did this for you as a filmmaker, but inspire a little bit of hope in the face of this great tragedy. Yeah, he certainly did in me, you know, um, uh, as soon as I saw he was the captain of the vessel, you know, it inspired confidence was one thing, right? <laughs> because, you know, w when someone's out drowning on the water and you have a choice to make between saving that person or saving three people over here, you want someone who is in control, one, and who has the experience of having been in a similar situation before. And John had both those things. He really, he could make those difficult judgment calls um, in a split second without thinking. So, so that, w that inspired confidence in the entire crew, I think. But more than that, you know, um, John was an optimist despite this really difficult work he was doing. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget some of the, the moments I was fortunate to have with him on the bridge late at night, you know, um, because when you're on a vessel like this, you know, you have to stay on watch and you, you, you do these watches. And... Um, we would spend late hours just talking about books and talking about poetry and talking about all these things that inspired us both and kept us going despite the nature of the work. You know, he's my kind of optimist, which I think is someone who, if you don't listen closely, you would deem a pessimist. But if you listen closely, he's a man who's very well aware of all of the pessimism and all of the sadness in the world and looks for these slight glimmers of hope and optimism which is a realist, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that, I mean, he, he fully embraced the reality and the political reality of the arena we were working in. And he said, so what? Okay, so the politics aren't necessarily, you know, uh, reshaping our way right now or evolving our way, but that doesn't matter. He still felt in his bone of bones that it was the right thing to do what he was doing and that he could sleep well at night if he did this kind of work. And that's how he lived his whole life, I think. Why do you think the politics have shifted so far to the right in dealing with the refugee crisis? Do you think it is just a sort of reactionary pendulum swing? Oh, I would have to be more of a politician to answer that well, I think. I, I, think, I think there are cycles of rhetoric and I think cycles of fear that we're caught up in right now. Um, and I think this one will pass too. I just hope it passes before... Uh, too much more damage is done. Um, I think we have some questions from our audience. We have two. Who has a question out here? Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious about your approach to documentary filmmaking. Um, do you see yourself more as a fly on the wall when you do films like this? Or do you like to get more involved on and off the camera? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, I always aspire to have quite a bit of verite in my films because I think um, an observational style, sometimes showing does a lot more than, than crafting the tell, right? And so there's always a lot of verite in my work. Um, but, you know, by necessity, oftentimes just to craft a story with without narration, of course, you know, I have to get a talking head interview in there. In this particular film, uh, we don't resort to a, a talking head interview until very near the end of the film. So I, I think it's a piece or a, a one of the tools in the tool set, um, and, and I aspire to it always. But your talking heads as well are not, are not providing a greater context to the story as a whole. Your, your talking heads are talking about their own personal experience. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's a, that's a great distinction to draw, I think. There isn't like an expert weighing in to give us the history of the Mediterranean. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, how are you? Thank you for making this important film. Um, I was wondering, this is a question from our online site. Um, what advice could you give to an aspiring filmmaker? What advice for an aspiring filmmaker? Um, if you believe in it, do in it, do it, and don't let anyone tell you it can't be done. Um, I think it's really important to um, not ask for permission. 
um, but instead listen to your gut. And if you feel like you have an important story to tell, you probably do. Um, Sky, congratulations on the film, on the Academy Award nomination. Good luck next week uh, at the ceremony. Is the ceremony? Do you get to go to the official ceremony, or is it like a governor's thing? How do you do? You get yeah, to do no, it? No, no. We actually we actually get to go. Oh, you guys get to. <laughs> yeah, we actually get to go. Yeah, so that's on the twenty fourth, and so our whole team gets to go and attend the Academy Awards. Congratulations, Sky Fitzgerald, everybody. Lifeboat. <laughs> Thank you.